Welcome to uh, tonight's event. My name is Dimitri Kralis, and I'm acting director of the Stavros Niaros Foundation Center for Hellenic Studies. Tonight, before we proceed, I would like to acknowledge the Coast Salish people on whose traditional territories we live, work, and thrive, or hopefully we thrive. Um, I want to reflect a bit on this uh, acknowledgement and the questions it raises about colonial rule, as the language of colonialism might not be unrelated to what will follow tonight. Uh, the few among you uh, who know me, and it is a small number in this room, uh, will be aware that I'm the kind of self-flagellating Greek who is all too fast to reflect on the failings of our country and its people. Tonight's talk, however, and our speaker, about whom you will hear more in a second by my dean, raises in my mind questions of colonial and quasi-colonial quasi discourses and narratives. Greece, after all, and its modern history, have not remained unaffected by Northern European geopolitical ambitions. As for the Greeks themselves, we have not been immune from understanding our relationship with Europe, to which we aspire to belong, in colonial terms. It is thus no accident that among some in the Greek left in Greece, and not only in the left, the country itself in the last few years has been read as a dead colony. The colonial language is potent, and it perhaps requires some analysis. But please take this observation more as my own musings and not as a hint of what is to follow in uh, Dr. Papadimitriou's uh, uh, talk, which I do not want to prejudge. He might or he might not return to that. Uh, we are here then for a Hellenic Studies event. And before I hand you off to my dean for uh, the opening remarks, I want to note the continued commitment of the Stavros Niaros Foundation Center for Hellenic Studies to a vigorous engagement with lay and academic audiences in Vancouver and beyond. Such engagement aims to relate and sometimes translate the Greek world and Hellenic culture in all its facets to as broad an audience as possible. We're very glad and thankful you joined us tonight, and we promise to keep bringing interesting talks and events to you in the future. Without further ado then, I want to welcome on stage the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, Dr. Pal Jane Palkingham, who will be introducing tonight's event and speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dimitris. As Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, it is also my pleasure to welcome you this evening. Tonight, in addition to being located on the traditional and unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, we are located in one of SFU's three campuses. The history of SFU's Vancouver campus, which was created some 30 years ago, speaks to Simon Fraser University's mission to be an engaged institution of higher learning, reaching out to and engaging various communities and publics. In this mission, our university has over the years benefited from the generosity of private donors committed to the vision of a robust public education. The Stavros Niarchus Foundation is one such donor whose generosity has helped SFU build a strong, active, and engaged community of scholars and students working on all facets of the Hellenic experience, both global and specifically linked to Greece. In its mission, the, the Stavros Niarchus Foundation has found allies and local donors, such as the Edward and McWinney, Emily McWinney Foundation, which in conjunction with the Stavros Niarchus Foundation, helped set up the Edward and Emily McWinney Memorial Lecture Series and a named professorship, the Edward and Emily McWinney Professorship in International Relations, for which we are undertaking a search this spring. The Stavros Niarchus Foundation also provides generous funding and support of SFU's Stavros Niarchus Foundation uh, Center for Hellenic Studies, which maintains an active academic and community outreach program in a variety of fields. This includes bringing high-profile high academics and leading professionals, such as Drs. Lucas Chukalis and George Dertelis, acclaimed director Costa Gavros, and journalist Robert Fisk. Tonight, on the occasion, uh, this occasion of the third annual Edward and Emily McWinney Lecture, it is my pleasure to introduce another noted speaker, Dr. Dimitris Pata, Papadimitriou. Dr. Papadimitriou 
is Professor of Pol Politics at the University of Manchester and Director of the Manchester Jean Monnet Center of Excellence. He's previously held visiting posts in uh, Princeton University, the London School of Economics, and Yale University. Dr. Papadimitriou has written extensively on the European Union's political economy and external relations, and he's also a leading scholar of Greek politics and public policy. His latest book, Prime Ministers in Greek, Greece, The Paradox of Power, with Kevin Featherstone, was published by Oxford University Press. And without any further ado, I wish to welcome Dr. Papadimitriou. Papa Dimitriou, and I can't say that very well, not nearly as fast as uh, Dimitri's when he just rattled that name out up here. I cannot do it that fast. But you know who you are, and you're welcome up here, please. Well, um, thank you all uh, very much for coming and giving up your afternoon for, uh, for this uh, speech. I'm very honored to, uh, to be here. Uh, initially, uh, very excited to uh, be leaving the madness that is uh, Britain and Brexit uh, 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 stricken Manchester right now. I, um, my excitement uh, was somewhat moderated when Dimitris asked me to talk about another painful experience, which is uh, um, uh, the Greek economic crisis and uh, the Euro crisis more generally. Um, it's, uh, uh, it seems to me that over the past decade, my professional life has revolved around crisis. I hope I don't bring uh, bad luck to Vancouver or to any of you. <laughs> I, I hope I don't. Uh, I will do my best. And uh, um, I will uh, like to uh, start my, uh, uh, my presentation by uh, sort of introducing uh, four interconnected themes that will uh, sort of guide today's, uh, uh, today's talk. The first one is to give a very brief reminder to all of you how Greece got into trouble uh, in 2010. I'm sure that for many of you that would be a very well-known story. For others, perhaps uh, not so much. Uh, then I will uh, go on to speak a little bit more about the narrative and the discourse that uh, surrounded uh, um, the, um, uh, the early days of uh, Greece's uh, bailout politics and uh, Greece's uh, rescued by uh, uh, um, uh, the European Union and the IMF, and then I will um, go on to discuss in more detail how that kind of narrative and that discourse condition the, uh, the remedy for, uh, for the Greek uh, crisis, and then I will uh, conclude with a few uh, uh, thoughts about, in a way, the, uh, um, uh, the impact of uh, uh, this uh, uh, um, uh, bailout, which has lasted for a long time, both uh, on Greek politics and, uh, of course, on uh, uh, the EU uh, more broadly, which is perhaps uh, uh, um, of more interest to uh, many of you who um, uh, are not so close to, uh, um, um, to Greece. Well, let me just first start by saying how Greece got into, into trouble. I'm not going to be too technical, don't worry, but uh, I, I just wanted to uh, remind everybody that uh, in uh, uh, the uh, late 2009, Greece was confronted with uh, 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 what has been named as uh, uh, the triple deficit of death. Uh, in other words, uh, at a period when uh, um, credit was becoming very scarce around the world, Greece ran a very uh, high budget deficit. It had accumulated over decades uh, the largest uh, gross debt in uh, uh, the European Union, and it was also suffering uh, um, a uh, very big current account deficit. Between you and me, this is not good news. Uh, uh, um, during a time in which uh, uh, people were getting uh, very worried about uh, lending money, and uh, uh, Greece, for that reason, was seen as uh, um, one of the um, uh, sort of weaker links within, within the, uh, the Eurozone. Now, behind this triple deficit of uh, death uh, uh, um, laid a, um, laid a um, uh, more structural problems with the Greek economy, not least the fact that uh, manufacturing and agricultural production in Greece has been in severe decline for a number of uh, uh, years. But also Greece's uh, uh, competitiveness uh, within uh, the Eurozone was decreasing fast. I mean, this is a... Um, uh, a graph that shows you how uh, the uh, uh, cost, uh, la labor cost in Greece, that's the red line, uh, increased massively after uh, um, 
uh, Greece's entry into, into the Eurozone, as indeed uh, 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 those of uh, Spain and Italy, and some of the peripheral economies of the EU. But look at the blue line at the bottom, that's Germany, right? So at the time when Germany was uh, uh, introducing austerity at home, uh, uh, peripheral European economies were uh, sort of uh, implementing policies that were um, uh, very, uh, very different. And uh, that kind of loss of competitiveness, it's something I'm going to come back to uh, towards the end of my, uh, of, of my speech. It is a big contrast and uh, uh, introduces us to uh, uh, the broader problem, structural problem within the, uh, the Eurozone. But uh, in addition to all of this, uh, uh, Greece, uh, since the mid-2000s, was also suffering a credibility uh, kind of uh, uh, um, crisis in the EU. Greece became a member uh, of the Eurozone, adopted the single European currency in 2001. Uh, but a few years later, the Greek government itself uh, questioned the statistics upon which its predecessor have managed to enter into this uh, uh, currency uh, um, 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 union. And of course, towards the end of the decade, uh, uh, the Greek government was under tremendous pressure from the EU to reveal the true scale of uh, the country's economic problems, which at that time were not, shall we say, properly reflected in uh, uh, the, uh, the statistics it was presenting the, uh, the Europeans. That's what became widely known as the Greek statistics uh, uh, fiasco, right? Uh, but uh, uh, all of this uh, towards the, uh, the end of 2009 uh, contributed to um, basically uh, um, a crisis of borrowing, that uh, Greece needed a lot of money to cover its deficits, but uh, uh, the markets were not willing to uh, uh, give that money, and uh, what that graph shows you here, well, Greece is the yellow line. You see that uh, from 2008, certainly in 2009, the cost of borrowing uh, for uh, the Greek government started to go, uh, um, um, to, 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 to become prohibitively uh, high. Other peripheral economies follow the same, uh, same pattern, but not as bad as Greece. But if you look at uh, a few years earlier, uh, uh, Greece was able to borrow from the international markets at uh, rates that were not too dissimilar to those of Germany. So uh, the markets attributed a kind of risk to borrow, to uh, lending to the Greek economy that was not too dissimilar to those of uh, uh, Germany. As uh, uh, the credit crunch took hold around the, uh, uh, the world, of course, people started to having second thoughts. Is it really right that uh, the risk associated with the Greek economy is the same? Uh, to that of Germany, the outcome is this kind of gap uh, uh, that uh, uh, developed towards uh, at the end of 2009. That is effectively the beginning of the Greek crisis, meaning uh, the Greek government being desperate to finance uh, uh, a lot of its uh, uh, um, own, uh, um, own debt. Now, the uh, response to this uh, 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 crisis was uh, conditioned by uh, um, a surrounding discourse in, uh, in Europe that uh, uh, was not very positive uh, towards Greece. I mean, this is a, um, uh, a, um, the cover of a very popular German uh, magazine. Uh, my German is not great, but I think it reads a crook in the Euro family. And uh, uh, very quickly, the whole discourse around uh, 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 Greece's potential rescue by the Europeans uh, uh, was cast in almost biblical terms. There was a sinner that uh, had uh, uh, um, um, done a number of terrible things in the run-up to, to the crisis. It was time for uh, redemption. And of course, how do you go about saving somebody who has seen is kind of a moral hazard. You want them to suffer for their sin, and you want others to uh, uh, um, uh, also be given an example of how not to behave. So in many ways, the, uh, um, um, the, uh, the, the, the Greek bailout, the Greek rescue, if you like, was cast upon uh, um, a discourse that uh, um, highlighted Greece's own failings and was also very cautious of the fact that uh, that kind of behavior should not be encouraged by other members of uh, uh, the European Union that might have uh, uh, similar, similar problems. In that context, and given the fact that uh, Greece uh, 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 was seen as a country that needed to be punished for uh, all of its uh, uh, sins, the kind of uh, uh, um, uh, framing of the crisis uh, stopped being, of course, uh, one that uh, um, saw Greece's problems as part of a shared problem and so on, that uh, Greece was part of the European Union, part of a community of nations that uh, sort of 
uh, would try to help each other, but very quickly develop into something different. And of course, the, uh, uh, the cleavage between debtors and creditors became very, very important because it was on the basis of that kind of rhetoric that uh, uh, the implementation of the bailout and the conditionality that was attached to the Greek bailout could really uh, become, uh, uh, um, become credible. Now, during the early parts, of course, of uh, 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 the crisis, the Europeans uh, framed it in terms of Greece being an exceptional case. Here you had a problem, of course, but that was not a problem that was a reflective of a broader sort of malaise within the European Union. No, the European Union fundamentals, policymaker told us, were absolutely fine, but you have an exceptional Greek case here, you know, Greeks have been uh, uh, not very responsible, uh, uh, not, not, not having done the, uh, uh, the right thing, run by corrupt elites and so on. So don't worry about the Eurozone as a whole. Greece is the problem and we will deal with it accordingly, right? But of course, that kind of, uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, in, in, in a way, um, Greek exceptionalist uh, 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 discourse mask many structural problems that uh, um, um, existed uh, within, uh, within uh, uh, the, uh, the European Union. The very fact that the crisis was also framed as a debt crisis uh, uh, was problematic in many ways because the, uh, uh, the Greek crisis was in many ways a debt crisis, but it was also uh, a, a part of a wider banking crisis, both in Europe and in uh, uh, the other side of uh, um, 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 the pond. It was a problem of uh, uh, diverging competitiveness uh, within Europe that was uh, uh, deeper than uh, uh, um, uh, simply Greeks being very lazy and drinking ouzo, you know, by the beach and not working uh, um, 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 a lot. And it was also reflective of the fact that the very design of the monetary union uh, 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 in, 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 the European, uh, in, in, in the European Union had many problems of its own. It had uh, uh, um, sort of uh, 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 certain parts of that uh, uh, union was incomplete. Its uh, uh, institutional framework was not uh, uh, um, exactly right. So you have a, a broader discourse at the beginning that focuses a lot on Greece. It is uh, um, an exceptional crisis. It is something that is more connected to Greece rather than uh, uh, anyone else. And it is a debt crisis. So somebody has been uh, 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 very poor with the, managing of, uh, with the management of the economy, run themselves into debt. Therefore, we need to uh, uh, act accordingly. And uh, uh, um, of course, the uh, response to this crisis it's complicated. I don't want to uh, um, uh, go into a lot of detail uh, here, but for those of you perhaps that uh, uh, um, are not so, uh, so familiar with the detail, it involved three bailout packages that uh, together they uh, cost over 200 billion Canadian dollars. Uh, they, uh, they took place over a period of uh, sort of uh, six or seven or seven years, but also involved two kind of interventions on uh, uh, reducing uh, Greece's, uh, Greece's debt. In 2012, a substantial kind sort of part of uh, uh, Greece's debt to the private sector was written off uh, uh, to the tune of 56 billion uh, uh, Canadian uh, uh, dollars. But more recently, in 2008, Greece was also uh, uh, given more time to repay the debt, its debt. The, so sort of uh, uh, the whole issue was uh, uh, dealt with not very satisfactorily, but uh, again, Greece was uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, was, was given uh, uh, more time to put sort of its, uh, its, its, its house in, in order. That, of course, didn't come for nothing. Uh, as a, 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 a response to this kind of rescue, to this bailout. And I uh, wanted to add here that what we often term as a bailout for Greece, what it means is basically the provision of loans, right? It's not the provision of grants. I, I am not a native speaker, but very often people understand the bailout as free money that you don't get to repay. That's not what happened in the Greek, uh, in the Greek case. Uh, um, what we have here is uh, uh, Greece's foreign debtors agreeing to uh, lend Greece money because the private sector could not do so. Uh, 
but uh, this was a loan nevertheless. It wasn't uh, um, um, a grant. And of course, in exchange, Greece uh, uh, agreed to do certain things as part of this conditionality of the three uh, programs, which were in turn uh, um, um, uh, executed and monitored by a troika of uh, three institutions, the IMF on one hand, the European Central Bank, uh, in uh, uh, Frankfurt, and the European uh, Commission in Brussels. So it was kind of a, an alliance, if you like, a, a, a marriage of three institutions that were uh, uh, responsible for administering uh, the, uh, uh, the remedy and uh, administering, uh, if, if you like, the pill. Now, what we call the Greek uh, bailout came officially to an end in September 2018. So Greece is no longer under a program officially, but of course the commitments that the Greek government have uh, uh, undertaken against its uh, creditors uh, uh, will continue to be relevant for many, many years. Indeed, uh, uh, Greece has agreed to run a very high uh, primary surpluses till 2060. Uh, um, and uh, the Greek uh, state, the Greek government has agreed to transfer state assets to a uh, um, development fund, which was primarily controlled by, uh, by uh, the Europeans, in order to privatize uh, nearly 33 billion worth of uh, assets, including regional airports, ports, uh, a big uh, bit of land, and so on and so forth. So this is uh, um, cumulatively uh, um, um, what became known as Greece's uh, rescue. It, it, it's complicated, and uh, often people uh, don't get the full, the full picture. But the full picture, as at least we have it today, looks something uh, uh, um, uh, like, uh, like that. Now, let me say a few words about the institutions uh, um, um, that were responsible for uh, dealing with the Greek crisis in, in, in 2009 and uh, for the next uh, uh, few years, and uh, how the kind of uh, uh, discourse and environment uh, that uh, developed in the early stages under conditions of uh, a very extreme crisis, both in Greece but internationally, in many ways disrupted uh, the way in which the European Union normally tends to do things. And the most important thing to uh, uh, um, uh, mention here is that the European Commission, which is, for a better word, the, the executive part of the European uh, Union, was weakened. Right? Uh, and was weakened because many countries within the European Union accused the European Commission for not having done enough to stop the Greek crisis from developing uh, to, to such an extent and for not being able to uh, um, um, sort of uh, uh, discipline the Greek government in, in, in the run-up to the crisis. So uh, the Germans uh, uh, in particular were absolutely furious about this because that was effectively what the European Commission was there for. And it is because of that kind of uh, criticism against the European Commission that Germany in particular was very, very keen to have the International Monetary Fund uh, um, um, involved in the Greek bailout, right? Because the, the, the IMF knows these things, right? Knows how to deal with this uh, crisis, knows how to do disciplining a lot better from the European Commission that is a little bit more wishy-washy and uh, a kind of uh, not the type of institution that uh, uh, operates under these, uh, these conditions. The handling of Greece also uh, demonstrated uh, a lot of intergovernmental characteristics. Now, that's a little bit of a, uh, a Euro jargon in a way. What I'm trying to say here is that the, the, uh, um, the dealing of uh, the Greek crisis effectively became owned by national governments rather than federal institutions of, uh, of uh, the, uh, the European Union. And that was significant because uh, uh, if you look at the, how the money was put together that was ev eventually uh, um, uh, uh, lent to Greece, if you look at how the Eurogroup, that's the 28 finance ministers that were responsible for dealing with the Greek crisis, operated within the EU, meeting in secret, uh, not having uh, uh, agendas or minutes uh, published afterwards. If you look on the fact that the European Parliament, which is the only institution in the European Union that has directly elected members from the European electorate, had nothing to do with the bailout, you see that there were a lot of issues there with the, 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 what you might call the, uh, the democratic legitimacy of the whole exercise. It was something that was done by finance ministers in secret outside the, uh, the public uh, um, 
uh, and the public gaze, as it were. And of course, the fact that the federal institutions in Europe were not that involved with Greece's uh, bailout made Germany the largest and most powerful economically nation in the European Union absolutely critical with, uh, 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 with regards to the handling of the Greek crisis. And that's something that the Germans were not used to. Very often people in Greece assume that uh, Germany wanted to act as a colonial power in, in Greece and so on. The truth is that the Germans did not really know very well how to deal with this issue. They were very upset, of course. Uh, uh, they had ideas about how this might be uh, 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 resolved, but they were presented with a crisis. Germany was the biggest economy. This is where the money was, and Greece needed money, right? We're going to do that in an, in an intergovernmental fashion, so Germany becomes very, very critical. But it becomes very critical outside the framework of uh, 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 democratic legitimacy. So a lot of Greece felt, why do we get Germany to tell us what to do? You know, Germany occupied Greece during the Second World War. Uh, uh, for many Greek people, that was seen as something that was unacceptable. It was seen as something that uh, reminded them of uh, things that uh, they thought would never happen again. But it was also unacceptable for many Germans too. Why should we, the hardworking German taxpayer, bail out the Greeks? This is not our crisis. It's not us who run the, uh, uh, the deficits. Why are we then asked? Uh, uh, to, to pay for it. It was therefore an arrangement that was not satisfactory from whichever angle you, uh, you look at it, and that was, I think, quite uh, significant. But uh, further than this, the, the Troika itself, the, uh, the alliance of these three institutions was very, very dysfunctional. Here you have the European Central Bank having to monitor and implement a program of macroeconomic adjustment, having to implement austerity. But central banks are not supposed to do these things. Central banks are meant to be doing with the currency, right? And the European Commission was there, but the European Commission is not an IMF type of institution. The European Commission is meant to be the consensus builder in the European Union. So how can you be a consensus builder and enforcer, enforcer at the same time? It was problematic. It was also very problematic for the IMF because normally the IMF had to deal with crises of these types in the third world, in the developing world. Uh, its recipe for dealing with these things is that you go in, you devalue the currency, you implement a lot of austerity, you chop some of the debt off, and off you go back to the free market again. But in Greece they couldn't do that, because Greece was a member of the single European currency. They couldn't devalue. The European Union also didn't allow uh, uh, for uh, Greece's debt to be reduced at that time. So it was in a very awkward position. It was a marriage of convenience that was put together hastily at the peak of the crisis, but over the years produced a lot of issues and a lot of problems. And I will return to this in a few minutes. Now, what was the taste of that uh, uh, remedy and how is it connected to that kind of... Uh, um, uh, a discourse that I mentioned uh, earlier on. Well, the taste of the remedy was the, uh, um, 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 the, the deepest and longest lasting recession ever seen in uh, uh, peacetime, basically. Uh, I've got a, um, a, a, um, a couple of graphs here. You don't need to uh, look at the detail. Uh, perhaps on the bottom left, it might be something interesting for you. That is a comparison between the Greek recession in the, two, in, in, in the 2010s, and the 1929 crash. And what you see here is that Greece's economic implosion was of the same magnitude as uh, the 1929 crash, but it lasted a lot longer. So it was a, as painful a retraction as that of the 1920s in, in the States and in, 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 in Europe, but it lasted for a lot, uh, for a lot longer. On the other uh, graph there, the blue line is Greece. You see the kind of uh, uh, um, uh, destruction of economic activity as compared with uh, 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 other peripheral economies in, in, in the EU and against Germany. You see that uh, at the time when uh, um, uh, Germany was kind of uh, growing during the crisis, not a lot, but still growing, uh, the Greek GDP depreciated by nearly 30%. Now, Try and think about that in the Canadian context, right? How would it feel if the Canadian GDP 
decreased by 30% in four years. It's big stuff. Uh, and it is a, a politically a very difficult problem to, uh, um, uh, uh, to deal with. Now, of course, both the European Union and the IMF have accepted that the, uh, the, the programs have been uh, um, uh, problematic. I mean, the fact that we had more than one uh, uh, um, uh, a bailout program as initially envisaged and we ended up with three. The fact that uh, uh, Greece's debt was rescheduled a few times and still the crisis persisted uh, made it clear that something had gone wrong with how the program was designed and uh, um, um, executed. And as I said earlier on, the, uh, the IMF has been uh, um, remarkably candid about this. They said, you know, we, we underestimated the kind of impact that this kind of uh, austerity policy will have on Greece. Why is that the case? Well, that's a difficult uh, uh, um, question to answer. What is definitely true is that the program, because it was so punitive from the very beginning, had built into it very unrealistic expectations. The plan originally, that is the, uh, the red line on the top of that uh, uh, graph, was for Greece to experience a sharp recession and in the third year of the bailout program, the economy would start it to, uh, uh, to grow again. But it didn't work that way. It worked as the uh, um, uh, purple line suggested. The recession was deeper. The Greek economy did not uh, uh, recover early enough. The debt, because of it, was also skyrocketed and uh, uh, was uh, uh, um, uh, made even harder to deal with. So it was a program that had uh, 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 built into it from the very beginning many, many uh, uh, um, uh, sort of false expectations, false uh, um, um, assumption. But also the ability of the Greek government to deliver this kind of adjustment program, the biggest adjustment program ever seen in the West during a peacetime uh, uh, period, uh, um, was also very evident. A lot was asked by the Greek government, even though people in the European Union and in the IMF knew that that's probably not the best uh, government to deliver this kind of program. How did they know? Well, Greece has been a member of the IMF for 70 years. Uh, it has been a member of the European Union for 35 years. It was not an unknown quantity, but still, what was asked from the Greek government at that time uh, uh, was uh, uh, um, uh, uh, perhaps unrealistic. Many people argue that even the kind of commitment that the Greek government has undertaken to run primary surpluses for 40 years, never seen before in the world, by the way, it's also unrealistic. Is it possible to argue that uh, 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 the Greek economy or indeed any other economy will not run into a recession for the next 40 years, that it will be able uh, to sustain these kind of surpluses uh, uh, for that long? And even if they did, what would that mean for the ability of the Greek government to grow? And if the Greek, gov the, of the Greek economy to grow? And if the Greek economy does not grow, how will Greece repay the mountain of debt that it has accumulated already? So you can see that there are a lot of issues here, right, and uh, um, 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 a lot of uh, worries that, uh, in my opinion, many of which can be traced back to the early kind of uh, uh, narrative and uh, take on the Greek crisis by uh, uh, the country's uh, uh, creditors. I'll say a few words about the, uh, the impact of uh, uh, the crisis on, uh, uh, on Greece first, and then I will move on to the European side, because a lot of uh, arguments have been put uh, uh, forward about what was the, um, how much damage the, uh, the, uh, uh, the bailout years have done to, uh, to Greek uh, democracies. Well, the first thing to mention, of course, is that uh, 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 the, uh, the austerity that was uh, imposed by Greece's creditors created a lot of uncertainty and a lot of turbulence on the executive. Now, over the past 10 years, Greece has uh, had five uh, general elections, has had eight different governments. You can see that the, the weight uh, and the, 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 uh, the pressure that this kind of economics puts on the uh, uh, government uh, in Athens has been very difficult to bear. And uh, uh, with the exception of the uh, uh, Syriza government uh, recently, all other governments during the crisis have not lasted the full term. Right? They, have, they have been coming under tremendous pressure to, uh, um, 
uh, uh, to deliver something that was uh, very, very unpopular at home. But of course, Greece is exceptional in a way in that it was the only country uh, uh, that was uh, to receive a bailout from the European Union for which there was absolutely no consensus about the bailout. Now, the, the bailout is unpopular. They always are unpopular because they involved a lot of pain. But in Ireland, the main political parties were able to agree that we will swallow the pill in the first couple of years and hopefully we will come out of it. The Portuguese, the same. The Cypriots, the same. The Greeks, no. Uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the, 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 the consensus building uh, process during the early parts of the uh, uh, bailout years was uh, not very successful. The idea that uh, all of us should sort of uh, uh, join together and help the country uh, through uh, uh, this uh, kind of uh, recession did not really uh, materialize. So in many ways, the main cleavage of the past 10 years in Greek politics was in a way a really crazy one, right? Those in favor of the bailout against those who are opposed to it. Like there was any politician in Greece that really enjoyed it. Right? and uh, whose career would not have suffered by uh, uh, implementing that kind of austerity. But that was uh, uh, the, the sort of the fundamental cleavage in Greek politics for a long time. And the reasons why that happened, we can come back to it if you are uh, interested in that uh, in our Q&A. Um, the other thing that has uh, become very evident over the past 10 years is that uh, the crisis uh, um, reshaped the party system in Greece. So now we have more parties in parliament. Uh, gaining uh, outright majorities has become very, very difficult. So the need for coalition government becomes absolutely imperative. But in a country who has absolutely no culture uh, of uh, consensus building, Greek politics have been adversarial. Ask somebody who uh, uh, looks at uh, uh, Byzantine politics or uh, 19th century Greek politics, 20th century Greek politics, Greeks don't do consensus, right? And uh, uh, when they don't do consensus and you are confronted with a problem of that magnitude, uh, chances are that it's going to have a very disruptive impact on uh, uh, your politics. And that's exactly uh, uh, what, we, uh, uh, what we saw. Part of this, of course, uh, 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 is reflected in the fact that uh, uh, in, more, uh, in, in recent years, anti-systemic parties in Greece have, uh, uh, um, um, have uh, flourished. Anti-Europeanism has also become quite evident in a country which for many, many decades had almost total consensus, pro-European consensus. This is not Britain, by the way, right? This is a country that from the 1980s all the way to, uh, 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 from the mid-1980s all, all the way to the outbreak of uh, uh, the, uh, the crisis, anti-European attitudes fair, barely registered over 20%. Now, in nine years, that 20% has become nearly 50%. So uh, Greece today, I mean, this is, I don't know how easy it is to see. That's the, uh, uh, the yellow line and the light blue line there, right? This is people who absolutely hate uh, the EU. That's the yellow line. And the, the light blue line is those who are skeptical about the EU. Now, nearly half of uh, 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 the Greek people are negatively disposed towards the, the European Union. The situation has improved recently, but in 2015, for example, when Syriza came to power, that was even higher, right? So clear evidence of a shift here that the uh, uh, Greeks are no longer accepting the European Union as something that is unconditionally good. The same is also true for Italy, but I don't want to uh, uh, um, uh, go uh, there right now, but we can discuss it. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, more perhaps in the Q&A, if you like. What does that tell us about uh, uh, Greek, Greek democracy? I mean, right now, uh, uh, Greece has a, uh, one of the most unhappy people in Europe. Pessimism is, uh, record, is, is recording very high, uh, very high scores. There are Eurobarometer uh, polls that uh, trace that over many, many uh, years. Right now, nearly 80% of uh, Greek people are either very dissatisfied with democracy in Greece or fairly dissatisfied. Greeks have always not been particularly happy about the quality of their democracy, even before the crisis. But right now, uh, they are extremely, uh, uh, extremely unhappy. But 
not everything is a, a, a bad news. I'll come back to this in a minute, but it is interesting, for example, to record that right now the anti-systemic vote, uh, the sort of anti-European, uh, anti-systemic vote in Greece, is likely to score in the late teens. Now, that's not so bad uh, for a country that lost nearly one third of its wealth over a decade, right? The, uh, uh, the strength of anti-systemic uh, uh, vote in Greece now is likely to be lower than that of Germany. It is definitely lower than that of uh, Italy. It is also lower than that of Britain. So there is a, a, an interesting paradox here, and uh, I shall uh, uh, return to this uh, 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 in a few minutes. Let me just go back to the broader picture, though, and uh, um, uh, the, the, the European frame, and the, how has the Greek crisis changed Europe? Right, because that's, I think, a quite important uh, issue here. Well, the first thing to, uh, to mention here that right now uh, the Eurozone is a more robust, if you like, uh, system than what it was in uh, 2009. The European banks are now centrally regulated by the European Central Bank. There is a pot of money that is available immediately available for rescues similar to that of uh, uh, Greece. The macroeconomic monitoring of uh, uh, the Eurozone's member states is also uh, uh, more, uh, uh, more robust. But still, what we might call economic governance uh, within, uh, the European, uh, uh, within the Eurozone is contested. We have a monetary union, so uh, all member states share the same currency, but we cannot yet agree whether we should redistribute resources from richer nations to poorer nations, something that uh, it happens in all normal federal states. I guess it happens in Canada, it happens in the United States, it happens within Germany, right? It happens in other uh, parts of, uh, of the world where you see federal systems, but in Europe there is resistance. And there is resistance primarily from Germany, right? Because Germany is the, the largest uh, e economy in the Eurozone. Ta German taxpayers do not feel the same sense of demos with the Greeks or the Italians, right? If you ask somebody from Toronto, do you mind giving some uh, uh, resources to Ottawa or something like this, they would say, yes, we're all Canadians, you know, we, we are all part of the same community. The same in Britain or in Germany. But ask a German to uh, uh, pay with their taxes the Greeks or the Italians, it's a different thing. People are always worried about giving uh, uh, their taxes to other uh, more needy citizens, even in the best of uh, 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 political unions. But in Europe, that is something that is even more, uh, um, uh, um, 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 more evident. It is also true to say that uh, as a result of the outcome, Europe today looks more German in the outlook of its economic and monetary management uh, 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 than ever before. The sort of orto-liberal uh, um, uh, sort of conception of a monetary union where you don't run deficits when you have a very low inflation, you are always export-driven and uh, uh, um, very careful with uh, uh, um, uh, your, uh, um, your prices and so on, is now the norm in the European Union. But the question is, can the European Union consist of 27 little Germanys? Can uh, the uh, industry of Greece or of Estonia or of, Estonia is actually quite good, or of Hungary or of Italy even compete in the same way that the uh, uh, German industry can? And the answer is that uh, these kind of uh, uh, differentials in uh, competitiveness, in uh, uh, export orientation and so on, have been built over centuries. Is it possible to uh, apply them in a universal manner across all EU member states? It's, it's difficult. Many people suggest that uh, perhaps uh, 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 it's not. What is also absolutely clear, of course, in the context of the EU is that the kind of uh, uh, narrative, the kind of expectation that uh, as part or by virtue of your membership of uh, uh, the European Union, you would sort of converge towards a mean and that uh, uh, economic differences between member states will become uh, 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 um, um, less, uh, less pronounced has ended, right? Uh, uh, the, uh, the whole kind of uh, uh, motto right now in Europe is compete, right? 
uh, I'm, I'm expert, uh, look at the world and so on, do not expect the, uh, uh, the Eurozone to deliver greater kind of uh, uh, equality or uh, economic convergence uh, uh, between, uh, uh, between the member states. And that, of course, is connected with a moral hazard uh, thesis that I mentioned at the very beginning, right? That don't expect us Germans or Finns or uh, Dutch to bail you out. You swim uh, uh, on your own. If you can't swim, tough. Right. It's interesting that uh, uh, one of the most uh, persuasive arguments of Konstantinos Karamanlis uh, to his uh, uh, European uh, counterparts in the early 19, in, in the mid 1970s was that uh, Greece will never be ready in advance of joining the European Union. That we will, this is what he used to say to Schmidt and others that uh, uh, we need to throw Greece in the deep waters and then Greece will learn to swim. It hasn't really become a, ter a terrific swimmer. Uh, uh, um, and right now, if you are not a terrific swimmer, you are in trouble, right? Because the safety net uh, uh, um, or the, uh, the Lilo that uh, you so desperately need is not so uh, easily, uh, uh, um, um, easily available. The crisis has also, of course, produced uh, uh, um, a lot of populism around Europe, not only around Europe, in the United States too, in other parts of the world too. What is absolutely fascinating from a political science perspective, of course, is the, the paradox, the, uh, the, uh, um, uh, the kind of uh, um, unanswered question, which is why countries that are economically prosperous, that have not suffered during the economic crisis that much, like Germany, has today an anti-European party an anti-systemic party that scores 20% in the polls. Why did the British go the way they did? Why did the French, uh, uh, um, 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 very nearly elected Le Pen as their uh, 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 president? What is it about the crisis that has destabilized the most prosperous parts of the European Union more than those who suffered the most? I mean, it has destabilized Italy, uh, which is right now in not a great uh, state, but it has also destabilized uh, countries that uh, you would not necessarily expect them to, uh, uh, to be destabilized. So as a Greek, I feel quite good that uh, um, you know, our economy is in tatters, that's true, uh, but our democracy, even though it's relatively young, uh, less than uh, sort of 40, uh, 40 years old, was able to remain a democracy, not a great democracy, but a democracy, a Western democracy nevertheless, having lost nearly one third of its wealth. And how many democracies will be able to, uh, to sustain this? I'm not sure. I hope no other country has to find out, so we don't have a comparator right now, but it is a kind of interesting, I think, uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, an interesting observation. And uh, the final point here is, uh, what does that all mean about uh, uh, um, um, membership of the European Union? What does it mean for fu the, the future development of the European Union? If the European demos is so fragmented, if taxpayers from one country see such a terrible idea to support other countries that uh, do not have the same level of uh, development, how can this project ever develop into a political union? It is a political union in paper, but uh, in practice it is not. And how the European Union engages its citizens to buy into the project, and that involves, of course, both Greeks buying into the European project, having suffered so much over the, ten, the past 10 years, but it also involves Germans buying into the project, having been conditioned to fear and loathe the fact that some of their wealth is redistributed to the broader uh, European community. And how you square that circle uh, is not at all uh, 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 easy. These are the kind of issues that, uh, Europe now, uh, uh, that Europe now uh, faces. It is a developing political community. Uh, uh, it's not as yet a federal state like Canada or uh, the United States. But how do you go about building this kind of sense of community, this kind of sense of demos uh, 
amongst the uh, European nation remains a big uh, 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 question mark. And uh, on that uh, rather um, uh, pessimistic note, I shall finish. Thank you very much. I've got something here to zap you. If you... <laughs> and, uh, let's open it up. Yeah? Thank you very much for your talk. If you mentioned Italy in passing and the dissatisfaction of the EU, perhaps you can elaborate a little bit in terms of what is the political uh, atmosphere sorry, and climate right now. Uh, just kind of a, sorry to interrupt. Um, just like when you phone your bank, right, and your, your phone call is recorded, so too are your questions today. So please use the microphone when you're asking questions. Uh, thank you. So very, very briefly, many thanks for, for, your, for your presentation. If you could please elaborate on Italy and the dissatisfaction with the EU uh, and the political climate that is uh, currently in place. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think that's, that's a very important issue in a way that uh, um, Italy matters for the European Union much more than Greece. Italy has been a founding member of the EU. It has been around for a very long time. The president of the European Central Bank is Italian. And more to the point, Italy's debt is over one trillion euros. So it's five times the size of that of Greece. Uh, and if Italy goes wrong, Italy is too big to bail, right? So the, uh, the trajectory of Italy over the next uh, uh, few years matters for the European project hugely. Now, many Italians, uh, uh, even though the kind of recession they have experienced is nowhere near, uh, uh, that of uh, Greece, feel that the euro has uh, disadvantaged their economy, feel that Germany benefits uh, uh, too much from the euro and is not willing to share some of the uh, gains for it. And they are also, of course, uh, very angry about the, uh, what they see as lack of European support for dealing with uh, the refugee crisis in Europe for which is very big news in, 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 uh, uh, Italian, in Italian politics. So what you have right now in Italy is, of course, a coalition of populists. On one hand, the political party of a former stand-up comedian that uh, uh, is associated with some very unpleasant uh, people in, in, in Brussels and elsewhere, and of a uh, kind of a, a extreme right-wing Lega Nord uh, 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 party that hates refugees, hates the Europeans, uh, uh, and uh, increasingly hates its coalition partner, too. So uh, uh, Italy is not in a good, uh, 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 is not in a good uh, place right now. Greece, for all, of the, for all of its problems and all of the uh, initial confrontation between left-wing Syriza party uh, and, and, and Brussels, have been uh, uh, increasingly moving towards the mainstream who can debate how successfully and so on, but from a Brussels point of view, uh, Syriza has been domesticated. But the loss of, the potential loss of Italy, it's a lot harder to, uh, uh, to deal with, both politically and economically. And that's why people worry about it right now. That, that was an amazing presentation of Haristopoli. I just have three points I'd like you to comment on. They're not often brought up in the discussion of the crisis. Uh, the first one is you mentioned the moral hazard. Uh, what about the, the banks, especially the French and German banks, which lent money to Greece in a risky situation? And under the kind of understanding of capitalism, if you take out risk, you, you might lose it and you don't get bailed out by, the, you know, by other people. Uh, secondly, there was an OECD study that came out in 2013, and it said of all of the major countries in the world, only South Koreans put in more hours of work than Greeks did, and Greeks worked more than Germans, for example. And finally, in 1953, as you know, uh, Greece was one of the countries that agreed to forgive German debt for the Second World War and the Holocaust and the occupation of Greece, and why can't Germany reciprocate? Thank you. Right, thank you, uh, 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 thank you very much. That's uh, um, three I important uh, um, questions. I I've already forgot the first one. Uh, uh, um, that was... Moral 
the moral hazard. Of course, I, I mentioned in the uh, uh, um, uh, presentation that uh, one of the things that uh, people don't often talk about in the context of the uh, uh, Eurozone crisis, it was uh, 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 that the, it is the fact that it was also a banking crisis. And that goes back to what you were saying. Of course, uh, uh, to, to create a debt crisis, you need, it takes two to tango. Somebody borrows the money, but someone is also willing to give the money. And uh, why uh, uh, European banks, and not only European, American banks too, and, and others, uh, uh, um, uh, ascribe the same risk to uh, 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 lending Greece money to that of Germany, it's beyond me, right? Uh, uh, how could it be that the Greek, uh, the fundamentals of the Greek economy, even during the good times, you know, the early 2000s and so on, were seen as similar to that of Germany? It is, uh, uh, um, uh, it is, uh, it doesn't make sense. And uh, the problem here is one of uh, uh, banking uh, uh, regulation. The Europeans have done more in, as a response to the crisis to regulate the banks that, uh, uh, than uh, either the Americans or the British have done. So in that sense, uh, the, the crisis have taught the Europeans a lesson, and now the European Central Bank uh, regulates the hundred biggest banks in, uh, uh, um, uh, in, in the Eurozone. So that is quite, uh, um, quite, uh, uh, um, um, quite important. The second point about uh, Greeks working uh, um, uh, many hours, I have seen that, uh, um, that statistic as well. You need to uh, open up this black box a little bit uh, because some Greeks work an awfully long, uh, uh, awfully long hours. Others uh, do not work uh, um, um, that many. So it, it's an aggregate and we need to uh, keep that in, in mind. The other point, of course, is that to work uh, uh, long hours is not a, a, a sufficient uh, conditions for economic success. Now, uh, uh, that goes back to the issue of uh, the more structural uh, uh, um, uh, dynamics behind the lack of competitiveness in Greece and uh, uh, the southern part of the European Union that have to do with the structure of finance, that have to do with uh, the size of uh, uh, um, firms in Greece and in other places in the south, that has to do with investment, with infrastructure. Now, all of these things, uh, these kind of uh, uh, important contributors to the, 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 the competitiveness of any one country, take time to build. And more to the point, take money. But who's going to give the money to make uh, 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 the Greeks more competitive? Right? It will have to come from Europe, but does Europe want to do that? The Europeans will tell you that even the limited amount of money we have given you to train your workforce and to improve your I infrastructure and so on, you kind of squandered it a little bit. They have a point, right? Uh, uh, but uh, uh, you are absolutely right to mention that statistic about Greeks working a lot, but it's not only about working long hours. It's about working better. It's about uh, 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 having a more outward-looking economy. How can it be, for example, that uh, for a country that has over 300 days a year sunshine uh, 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 is so dependent on food imports. You know that uh, at the height of the Greek crisis, people were saying that if we leave the single currency, we won't have enough money to import food. Uh, for those of you with a, a, a Greek background, you know, you're probably going to be surprised to know that uh, Greece is a net importer of lentils which used to be the stable diet of the Greek poor for centuries. So what I'm trying to say in a very long-winded way is that there are, there are deeper uh, um, uh, uh, issues about competitiveness here that need to be addressed. On the 1953 agreement to forgive a, a, a German debt, um, I know this argument has been uh, uh, made by uh, uh, the Syriza government when it came to, uh, uh, to power. I am not entirely convinced, I have to say. Uh, I'm not sure that the circumstances are exactly uh, um, the same. But uh, I do uh, I think that uh, the, uh, uh, the biblical terms which structured uh, the, uh, the, the, the narrative of the Greek crisis made many uh, 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 European policymakers to become too aggressive, 
towards Greece. And more to the point, it's not so much that they insulted uh, the Greek uh, people or the Greek political elites. You can perhaps swallow that or not swallow it. But what is important to me is that that kind of biblical narrative clouded judgment for a smarter bailout strategy that would not have involved so much pain, uh, both in Greece and in other parts of uh, the European Union, and could have perhaps delivered uh, uh, quicker and better results. Yeah. Uh, sorry, it's uh, this gentleman in, 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 in the Uh, thank you very much for the speech. Uh, we learned the troubles of, of the bailout for Greek and the conditionality attached and the supervision. Mm -hmm. And we know the bailout was uh, mainly driven by Germany, which has occupied uh, Greek, so uh, caused some uh, emotion problems. And also an outside the IMF was brought in. And I think this is also an issue because it's a European Union issue, right? But, mm -hmm. And also the lady mentioned about the, the Italy situation. And we understand that recently China has signed an MOU with Italy for the one bill, one row, and also to run the port. Mm -hmm. And also I think this is similar and also loan some money. So this is similar to a foreign bailout. And also China has similar program to Greek. So what do you think about this kind of uh, bailout? That's a good uh, uh, point, and it's something that uh, uh, many uh, Europeans are very worried about. You know that uh, uh, both Greece and Italy, for those of you perhaps who are not so familiar, have uh, uh, struck deals with uh, uh, the, uh, the Chinese government to uh, be part of the new Silk Road into, uh, um, into Europe. Uh, uh, China uh, today controls the largest port of Greece and one of the largest ports in uh, 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 the Mediterranean, Piraeus. Uh, they have uh, uh, made uh, more deals with, uh, with uh, uh, Italy. That is both uh, symbolically and materially important because uh, uh, um, uh, Greece has always historically had a, an ambivalent relationship with, uh, with Europe that uh, part of the Greek population did not feel Western enough uh, or did not uh, feel so committed to uh, uh, the, European, uh, the European project. It is interesting that uh, at the height of the crisis, particularly when Syriza came, uh, uh, came to power, there were people who actually said, oh, we, 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 we should go to Putin for money, or we should go to the Chinese. There was a problem there because Putin didn't have any money. Uh, 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 and the Chinese uh, did not really want to uh, put so much money into the Greek economy that they themselves knew that they might not get back. So the idea that uh, uh, others beyond Europe will see Greece with uh, more sympathy and so on, I think it's naive, right? Uh, 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 the Greek, uh, 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 Greece had an economic problem. Uh, Greece needed to readjust, so a lot of the pain was ju justified, was, was uh, called for because you, you cannot run an economy on this kind of uh, uh, um, um, uh, uh, deficits. The point I'm making here is that uh, um, the, uh, the bailout strategy was not best designed. And it was not best designed by institutions that ought to be no better. That's the kind of discussion we often have. You know. Why is it that uh, uh, the IMF was so surprised about the problems of the Greek labor market, for example. As I said earlier on, you know, Greece has been a member of the IMF since its very inception. Why would people uh, are so surprised that the Greek government could not deliver uh, when uh, there are uh, over five, 6,000 Greek employees in the European Union? Greece is not an unknown quantity there, right? So there must have been something else that clouded their judgment. And that's something else, I suspect, has more to do with moralism, with an overreaction to, uh, to, uh, to the crisis, uh, and ultimately to something that has uh, encouraged uh, political forces within Greece, but also within Italy and elsewhere, to look somewhere else. Now, my argument is that uh, um, no one 
can deal with the problems of Southern Europe better than the European Union. I'm not approaching this from an anti-European perspective, but it is an important thing to note that uh, uh, um, the bailout politics created that kind of expectations that uh, the Chinese or the, the Russians and so on will come in to, uh, uh, to resolve Greece's problems. Thanks for uh, crossing uh, the ocean and coming all over uh, to Vancouver and for the interesting presentation. If you can uh, scroll back, I'm sorry, it's a kind of technical point. If you scroll back to the slide where you have the bailout amounts and right. the PSI. I, have I got the numbers wrong? Well, yeah, and it matters. So I just looked it up. So let, let, let me, me just let me, check. Right, there you go. So I do appreciate the, the choice of stating the numbers in Canadian dollars so that ah. the local cr crowd can understand. However, uh, by just looking at the PSI, the PSI amount, the, the haircut was 105 billion uh, euros. If you translate that, actually, instead of uh, multiplying by, uh, by 1.45, you divide it by that. So 72. Uh, you got to multiply this by, by two. So that matters more, because... It was more than that, you mean? No, it's, it's double. Right. It's okay. double. No, sure. that, that matters because we need to understand the magnitude of the assistance that the European Union provided right. to Greece. Okay. So th the whole thing should be double. So if you include the PSI, we're talking about 500 billion Canadian dollars. Thank you. 360 uh, in terms of the bailouts plus uh, 150 in terms of the PSI, the haircut. That's number one. Uh, second it's point. Still big uh, money. It's 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 not just big money. It's huge. It's huge money. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Second point. I, I'm afraid I have to uh, play devil's advocate here. Uh, the talk was extremely informative, but I think the discussion and uh, the same thing applies to the discourse in Greece mm -hmm. is uh, at best incomplete. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of a of a cancer patient who is given an excruciating dose of uh, chemotherapy, and at the end, uh, the patient survives. And then we go back and we ask the, pa the patient about his experience, and the patient blames the oncologist because it was difficult, and, and, and the, the dose were too much, and he suffered. What I'm trying to say is that unless we address the cancer, we cannot complete this conversation. And I, I'm, I'm just going to cut it short. There are two points that I think should be part of this conversation. As we speak, the four systemic Greek banks are sitting on 110 billion euros of MPLs, non-performing loans. Mm -hmm. okay? You were right to claim that this was also a banking crisis. However, they had, this has nothing to do, had nothing to do with the, the subprime crisis of the US. Greek banks had very little exposure to that. Yeah, sure. It was all local, okay? It was the result of out of control lending to local uh, consumers and businesses. As we speak, they're sitting on 110 billion euros and they're scrambling to figure this out. I'm, I can tell you from personal experience. I've been negotiating uh, on behalf of my family with two banks for the past two and a half years. And they're not doing anything. That's, that's one. The second part, which is extremely important, and it's absent, not only from your uh, interesting presentation, but from the discussion, the, ex the, the, like the, the broad discussion in Greece, is the completely unsustainable pension system. If you look at the numbers, they're mind-boggling. The state budget contributed to the pension system close to 200 billion euros in the last 20 years. Okay? Unless we address those issues, again, I'm not trying to defend the Germans on anybody else. Exposed, we can discuss about how to do this better. But unless we look at what we did wrong, so that it's not, I, I'm, I'm very pessimistic, by the way. I don't think we can, we haven't made much progress. I see extreme resistance to any kind of meaningful reform. And I visit Greece like five times a year. I know, I have the data. I would, I would love to hear your thoughts. Thank you very much. Uh, many issues uh, um, um, raised here. Well, the, uh, the, the first point about, uh, um, of course, you're, you're right, hindsight is a wonderful thing, and uh, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the, the extreme time pressure with which the Europeans have to uh, uh, respond to the Greek crisis, which was enveloped, of course, in a much bigger global financial crisis, is very, very important. But uh, 
my answer to uh, what you said is that uh, don't take my word for it. Uh, just read the IMF own assessment of its program in Greece. And they are very clear. They said, you know, we, we, we've done it wrong. Uh, uh, um, it, it didn't work. Uh, the Europeans have been less forthcoming about uh, uh, their, own, uh, their own misgivings. But uh, I think that uh, it, it's, it's, a, um, it's acknowledged that the, the programs did not work very well not by Greeks themselves, uh, they don't matter that much in all of that in many ways, but uh, by the people who actually designed the program. So that is uh, uh, one thing. I think you are not right about the Greek banks. Again, looking at the Greek crisis in a comparative way, uh, you can tell that uh, the, uh, you, you are right that the Greek banks right now are all zombies. And uh, uh, the Greek economy operates in sort of uh, a, a pre-capitalist uh, um, uh, a pre-capitalist environment because the banks don't lend money, right? The banks don't have money to lend and they haven't been uh, 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 lending money to the real economy for 10 years. Now, how many Western economies can function without performing uh, 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 um, um, banks? You're right about the huge number, the huge percentage of non-performing loans uh, uh, that uh, uh, right now cause huge problems. Where you are not right is that the banking crisis in Greece was caused, is the outcome of a borrowing crisis of the government. Unlike, for example, the Irish case or partly the Spanish case, certainly the Cypriot case in which the, the crisis started from a private uh, a, 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 a sort of a borrowing problem. What was that? That the property prices in Ireland have gone through the roof. Reminds you of something here, right? That people overborrowed, right? And when uh, the economy turned the corner, people could not repay the mortgages. The problems of the bank at that point became a problem of the government. And the Irish debt, public debt, has uh, uh, increased by nearly 80% as a result of the uh, uh, um, uh, crisis, partly because uh, the state stepped in to recapitalize the banks. So you, what you have in Ireland, as indeed in Cyprus, is basically the nationalization of private debt and, and of a, 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 a banking failure in Greece. Banks were a lot more conservative. People forget that. You are right that they it, it, it have uh, uh, um, expanded a lot since the 2000s. Borrowing uh, um, uh, uh, grew an awful lot. But by European standards, it was actually quite low. So the Greeks, partly because of uh, uh, social reasons and the fact that many Greek families owned their own houses or past houses from father to daughter, unfortunately, or son, and so on, you know, the dowry system and so on, Greece had one of the largest percentages of uh, uh, house ownership in Europe. So you did not have the same kind of problems of uh, uh, over debtness of households that you had in Ireland or in, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 or in Cyprus, or I may say in Canada. Right? So you have two different trajectories here, and that is also kind of hidden from the, the kind of discourse of the Eurozone crisis as a debt crisis. Yes, of course it's a debt crisis, but is it a private debt crisis or a government debt crisis? In the, at the end, it doesn't really matter, because even if it is a, a sort of a private debt crisis, the, uh, uh, um, uh, the back is passed to the government. Right? But in Greece, it wasn't the banks that caused the crisis. In Greece, it was the government borrowing that caused the crisis that then turned banks into zombies because with the austerity that was implemented, people could not afford to repay uh, uh, the, uh, uh, their, uh, their mortgages. And now, nearly 50% of them don't pay the banks. Right? So it, I, I think you were not entirely uh, right about uh, uh, the sort of... the. Um, and the blame uh, uh, being directed to, uh, uh, to Greek banks. I forgot your third point, uh, which is, the, the, you, you, are absolutely, uh, you're, you're absolutely right about that. And uh, uh, um, the, uh, I'm trying to impress the dean right now, right? Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the welfare state in Greece was always uh, pension heavy, 
Uh, uh, and because it was so uh, sort of geared towards protecting the elderly, it completely uh, uh, left behind the young. The fact that Greece today has the largest youth unemployment problem in Europe, where 45% of those between 16 and 25 are unemployed, and the state has nothing, does not provide unemployment benefit, there is no housing benefit, there is nothing of that sort, is a huge problem. And effectively what you have is people sort of trying to uh, uh, spread their pensions, which have been cut massively since the crisis, to support the young. So you have a kind of, a, again, a pre-modern, uh, we, we thought we were past all of that, but we're not, uh, a, a pre-modern sort of welfare state where the elderly are bailing out the young, right? And because of that, there is so much resistance to, uh, um, um, to, to cut pensions even more. But I agree with you, it would have made a lot more sense uh, uh, to uh, provide support for the youth because the youth are likely to be wealth producers, hopefully, if they are trained, if they have a, 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 a better opportunities. But it's not like that. Uh, um, you're right. Okay, we have time for one brief question. Can we, uh, can we here in the front? Uh, yeah. Please. We'll take, shall we take three quick questions and then I'll try and answer them in not as a long-winded way as I have, I promise. Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add and to, to the comparative side of this. Uh, I spent 16 years on the island. I can honestly say it's, uh, we swallowed the pill, we internally devalued, and we weren't left off in any better position. We lived in the last decade for 10 years. If it worked, I would not be sitting in this room right now. Everybody from my generation below has migrated. So you're talking about, you know, the prices of houses, being able to buy houses. We call them mummy and daddy loans because you just cannot do it. Affordability mm. is not there. Work is not there. Growth is stagnant. The policies don't work. It doesn't matter how much is in the bailout package. The fact is that Ireland is an example, and the fact that European institutions use Ireland as an example is, is just a complete fallacy. We naturally are an export-led economy, graced by all means of the argument is a consumption-based economy. And the fact that they're trying to say that Greece is the same as Ireland in any European context was an absolute lie. And I feel like this is a part, you probably feel the same, that isn't touched on at all. The fact that they're using Ireland as an example for the last 10 years really, really gets to me. Mm -hmm. Can we get a, a, another question from this one from the front? Let's try and keep it brief and I'll, I'll keep my answer. Thank, thank you for an excellent lecture. Uh, my question is, do you think uh, the European Union will be uh, stay in and uh, progress, or down the road, if they're not become like Canada, the Federation will dissolve and finish? Good point. Thank you. You wanted to? Yeah. I thought you raised your hand. We don't That's make, fine. make you. No? <laughs> I would like to congratulate you. Congratulate you for the wonderful speech. Uh, now that we have this uh, here, I noticed that you made a mistake here. The delayed payment was in June 2018 and 2008, as you said. Number two, uh, I would like to ask you to... Uh, no, uh, as a point of information, I would like to tell you that uh, news came out about uh, the port of Piraeus yesterday and uh, they have made uh, very con considerable profits the last year. And uh, also, I had something else to say, uh, which is, which is, okay, that's okay. fine. Let me just uh, uh, pick fine. up on, uh, you're right about uh, uh, um, Ireland. Uh, Greece is a, a very different uh, uh, case from Ireland. I think it's worth remembering that here we have a debt crisis, we are told, in 2009, that has been dealt with successfully. But if you look at the, uh, the ratio of debt to GDP in Ireland, which is a success story, it's still 60 percentage points higher today than what it was in 2010. Ireland did not have a government debt problem, similar to that of Greece. But because it nationalized all of the bank losses, it now has a tremendous uh, debt problem. In Greece, debt, they, uh, uh, um, even after all of that, the debt 
uh, uh, ratio to GDP was at 1 to 8 in 2009. Now it's at 180 percent of GDP, right? Uh, uh, the same in Spain, the same in Italy. There we have the apparently successful resolution of a debt crisis that has left the countries involved in the programs with greater debt. I'm not sure how economists square this. I'm not an economist, but common sense will tell you that that's not really great, right? Uh, um, with regards to uh, uh, the European Union, I don't think that the EU uh, uh, will, will disintegrate. That's something that uh, uh, many people, uh, particularly in the States, felt that would happen uh, uh, in 2009. Ma many people thought that Greece would also exit the European Union, uh, the, the, the Eurozone, because of how damaging it was to its economy. But what often gets forgotten on that side of uh, the point is that uh, there's been tremendous political capital invested in the process of European integration in Germany and elsewhere. And I do not think that that kind of investment uh, will be left to disappear. I, I think that the EU will continue. It will probably integrate further, not as fast as it should. It never does. Uh, uh, but then again, in all of this, you should not forget the fact that uh, uh, in the EU we had a unique example of a, a fed the, the building of federal institutions in peacetime. So no one can impose on the other. It has to be done consensually. It has to be done with some degree of democratic legitimacy. And that takes a lot of time. It's very frustrating. The British, they don't like it. You know, they always want to have things quickly. Well, the EU doesn't work like that. The EU is a consensus-driven uh, project, and that frustrates many people. And uh, when it comes to crisis, it finds it very hard to respond because it takes ages for people to agree. But there is wisdom in that, too, you know, uh, that uh, I, I'm, I'm making things grow slower. Uh, making things uh, uh, um, develop the necessary consensus, it's also uh, good for the political system in which you're trying to, uh, to build. So I'm more Canadian in that sense than I am British, right? Uh, and uh, on, on the Piraeus, you, 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 you are right. The, uh, the Chinese are making uh, uh, money from Piraeus. Well, great. I have no problem with that. Uh, uh, if people get jobs and uh, um, 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 if people uh, have a decent... Uh, kind of uh, uh, investment in the in the region. If the environment doesn't suffer, I'm happy. I don't mind. Thank you. <laughs>